So the first thing about biceps pathology is really have to make a proper diagnosis. And it really goes down to something basic that we all learn in, in medical school, and that's what's their chief complaint. And many of these individuals are going to have coexisting pathology. It's really not that common that you see people with just an isolated biceps tendonitis. We do, but it's not the most common. And typically, you'll see it with cuff pathology, not uncommonly with, with osteoarthritis, and even with most commonly with labral pathology, where we have our older patient group who may indeed have a labral tear, but we think about their problem in a very different way based on their clinical presentation. Also, a patient who comes in with a failed previous cuff who continues to have pain, many of them will localize with classic bicep symptoms, anteriorly tenderness to palpation that gets completely better with an injection uh, into the groove. So the response to treatment, at least in my practice, is sort of the mainstay. If I have a patient who says, look, I hurt right here, and they have provocative signs, including a resisted uppercut, pain with internal and external rotation over the groove, and then we do an ultrasound-guided injection, which is actually about the only place I use ultrasound now, uh, <clears throat> because you know you get it in there. It's very gratifying. That's a patient, if he or she comes to surgery, you feel a whole lot better about what the result might be. MRI is very nonspecific, in my experience, especially for things that are down in the groove. So they have to have tenderness directly in that area. St statistically, the sensitivity and specificity of Jurgensen's speeds is not great, especially when you have other pathology that exists. But again, if you have them do an uppercut against resisted upward mo motion, motion, you ask them exactly where it hurts, let them point to the location, and then if a selective injection gets rid of it, then to me that's about as specific as you can probably get. Now, as I mentioned, there's uh, ultrasound to me is still the mainstay. This is, well, this is not your classic biceps tendonitis. My uh, PA, uh, uh, my PA does uh, our ultrasound injection. He's been trained. He helps train other uh, uh, individuals. He goes to meetings and trains people. So it's a real blessing to have someone because it is time consuming and I trust him more than I trust myself. He can put a needle directly into it and he can watch the uh, groove, uh, uh, the surrounding tissue uh, insufflate and you know you're in the right place. And then the most important thing is how they feel after you do it. So this sort of leads to the crux of the argument, why you would think about uh, up versus down. And um, this is a not uncommon situation. Those of you who do arthroplasty, for example, where you commonly would do a biceps tenodesis just because, look down in the groove, it is not uncommon to see tissue like this. And this doesn't present itself intraarticularly. You can pull the biceps two or three centimeters into the joint, and you may never see this. Sometimes we see some suggestion with a lipstick sign and things like that, but it's very intangible. This, to me, is very tangible when you add on to it the, the clinical symptomatology. And so a study we did a while back looked at um, the surrounding tissue and so forth, and it wasn't that clear as far as what's in this, but um, th there was definitely receptors positive for nociceptive and inflammatory receptors and markers around that tissue. It's really basically a tenus synovium. So if it's diseased, just like tibialis posterior tendonitis and other tendinopathies that have surrounding vested tissue, it can hurt. So who needs bicep surgery? Well, those who have the problem, uh, those who don't want it anymore, and those who fail non-surgical treatment. This is one condition I tell patients that surgical treatment can really make a difference. So I get them into a pec stretching program. You look at them, they're almost always carrying themselves forward. They often have scapular dysfunction. They're very tight in their strap muscles anteriorly. So if you get them into a good rehabilitation program, I'll even use a, a postural shirt, uh, such as a line med shirt or other, just to sort of keep them back. And it's amazing how many of these will get better without surgery. But the other ones who have trouble are those who have these concomitant diagnoses, and those are ones who may already be indicated for surgery, so possibly instability that extends into the biceps, rotator cuff pathology, uh, superior labral pathology is a big one. We have a large group of patients who have had primary slap repairs, typically your type 2 repair, who continue to have pain. We come back and do a biceps tenodesis, and they get better. And those are throwers. Those are overhead athletes. So it's a young population that we're going to be publishing soon. So be aware of the persistently painful slap repair in almost any age group, especially in those people who have a slap tear who shouldn't have a slap tear. Right, so our overhead occupational athletes, if you will, there's no reason in the world that they should have a slap tear. I don't care if they fall and they have a traction injury. That's generally speaking biceps before it is superior labrum. And then you do get the occasional patient who is uh, who has osteoarthritis. And if you're doing, if you're if you're advocating, say, for a clean out procedure, capsulotomy, things of that nature, sometimes managing the biceps can give you some incremental pain relief. The other issue now is that tenotomy doesn't always work. Uh, people say, well, there's no difference except for maybe a Popeye deformity. There's no question that if you do enough of these, you're going to come across patients who may complain of cramping and fatigue. And I think that as long as you have tenodesis available to you and you can do it in an efficient way and cost doesn't become a primary issue, um, I would say that there's enough literature to suggest that if you're going to do poorly, it potentially is going to happen if you do a tenotomy versus tenodesis, no matter where you put it in the groove. 
So who should get a tenotomy? Well, there still is a group that might benefit for a tenotomy, and that's those who have risk for infection, uh, those who can't comply with postoperative concerns, and those who have uh, certainly no cosmetic concerns. Who should get a tenodesis? Well, I would say probably everybody else, at least in my practice, because I really don't see much of a downside. Where can you tenodesh? Well, I'm going to talk to you about open sub -pec, but certainly it can be up higher in the groove, within the pec, if you will. It can be much higher in the, in the rotator cuff of the so-called so PID technique. So now we talk about the pros and cons of where, and you know, look, all of us, we have fun with these debates, and I can find articles to support either, either issue, but the bottom line is you rarely will find an article that says going high is better than going low, okay? So um, those articles do report, that do report both, and we're in the midst of a prospective study, the same technique, high versus low, that's gonna kind of duplicate others, but will be well-powered. But if you look at what's out there, generally speaking, you'll see articles like this that show that 40% of these patients still had pain proximally versus a subgroup that had no pain when they, were, when they went subpectral. So what are the things about proximal that may be a problem? This is an interesting article that looked at the innervation in this area, and if you go up near the transverse humeral ligament, the innervation basically on the, is on the lateral border of the long head of the bicep, so it's up high. So it gives you some thought to say, look, maybe it's due to an innervation issue. Maybe it's not that tenosynovium that's down way down the arm, because not all these patients have it, but maybe there's something to the innervation that is high near the transverse humeral ligament, and certainly when the biceps are taken away from that area, it's stripped of that innervation. Um, another suggestion of what's happening, so let's just say you open up the, uh, the sheath, right? Uh, this is a series from J.P. Warner, big series of patients, and they sort of just broke them down. They're not, com it wasn't a randomized study, they just looked at different uh, groups that underwent revision, and their number one revision uh, procedure for index was a proximal arthroscopic biceps tenodesis. Proximal open was second. Distal open was way down, and what was interesting is that when they open up the sheath, the revision rate was zero. So there's some suggestion, maybe you can do it proximally, but open up the sheath, and perhaps it has something to do with that innervation. Now, there's, there are some great reports. This is an early report from uh, uh, Gus Mazaka when he was uh, just after a fellowship uh, with uh, my partner, Tony. And they just looked at 41 patients, and you know they all looked good uh, when uh, tenodesis was done subpetrally with a biceps interference, with an interference screw, the so-called tenodesis, uh, classic biceps tenodesis. Number of reports that would substantiate the same, so I won't go into the outcomes. The one thing that's interesting is we focus a lot on the anchors, and obviously we're at a, 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 an Arthrex-generated uh, meeting, and you know anchors are important, but the reality is I pay more attention to the suture that's in the anchor than the anchor itself. A lot of these anchors, if they will work in cortical bone, and not all anchors are working cortical bone, it's difficult to take a, a threaded suture tack and get it into the cor cortical bone without maybe even incarcerating the uh, proximal aspect of the anchor and the inserter. But the biceps button, it works, works virtually every time. The thing that I've gravitated to, the reason I like a button, for example, is because you could put a large bore suture. So the work that we have now is if you look at pec repairs, for example, we spend a lot of time with these different configurations on pec repair and say which one's better, which one's worse. And it really has less to do with the anchor if you can get the thing to stay there than it does the suture configuration within the tendon. So if you do tenodesis, you know you're, getting the, you're, don't, you're docking the uh, tendon into a hole. Generally speaking, the fixation strength is probably as superior as you'll get anywhere. But if you want to do an onlay on the, on the bone, which is acceptable as well, you have to do some type of whip stitch, a Mason Allen configuration, something. But really, the load to failure is very much dependent upon the suture tendon interface. And that's just like what we see in the cuff when we're working with diseased tissue. It's, so it's a lot less about what anchor, and it's much more so about what suture. So I like to use label tape or suture tape just because the interface and differential strength and the, the, you know, the contact forces, not forces, but sort of the area of contact of the suture construct is generally going to be much greater. And that's the studies that look at distal migration of the biceps are really just using sutures where maybe they'll do a single pass or what have you, but because of the or orientation of the collagen is very easy to tear out. This was an interesting study that looked at uh, postoperative stiffness after arthroscopic versus open tenodesis, and I really, you'd have to talk to the authors. Uh, I'm not certain why they found this outcome, but stiffness was more frequent with those who went uh, super pec versus open. Don't really know why. Maybe they're closer to the rotator interval with that uh, operation. Maybe it was a bit diff diff different patient group. But uh, interesting finding of a complication that you didn't see with, uh, with the uh, sub pec. So this is my pre preferred method. Um, it's really straightforward. Um, I've, you, know, you can make a small incision right in the crease. Uh, so if you take the arm and in, just internally rotate, you can see right where the crease is. It's usually about three centimeters at most. Um, 
and we go right down to the medial border of the, of the uh, uh, deltoid at the Delta Petro Junction, lift, take an Army Navy underneath the pack, lift up, and it's right there. And if you're having trouble seeing it, just track the, the medial border of the pack with a, a, a curved hemostat, and you're going to find it covered in some level, layer of synovium, and it's very easy to retrieve. Um, so I put an Army Navy laterally. I put a Chandler retractor medially. I actually will take an osteotome and just fish scale the humerus. I like the fact that you can use wide tape and some type of uh, Mason Allen configuration. It's unicortical fixation. The, the, the hole is very small. Um, and then I'll just use one thing I've learned just as a pearl. These wounds can have trouble just vis-a-vis -vis their location. Uh, P. acnes loves to live in the armpit. Uh, there's a, sometimes they sweat postoperatively and so forth, and it gets macerated. So I basically only use monofilament sutures. So I use 3-0 monocryl. Then I will use uh, uh, Dermabond over the, over the surface and generally won't use um, uh, stereostrips. You've got to be a little careful if you combine stereostrips and Dermabond. And uh, that, we hardly ever have issues with wound, but early on we used to. Uh, there are some complications with biceps tenodesis. Uh, even I've seen, I have seen fractures through these 2.5 to 3 millimeter holes, seen them through suture anchors. Uh, they're, fortunately, they're very rare. The, the catastrophic complication is getting lost. And, Unfortunately, I've had the uh, opportunity to defend a couple of physicians who uh, either harvested the median nerve or had significant median nerve neuropraxias. And, uh, you know, you got to know the difference. One thing that can happen is if you try to sweep the tissues medial, take, say you're going to take a Holman retractor and take the, long, the short head of the biceps and the brachialis medially to expose the humerus, you can inadvertently take the biceps with you if it's mobile down at the level of the pec and then you're kind of lost. Or you can just be too far medial uh, in the axilla and things just get very, the waters get very muddied. So if you preserve your fascial planes, you'll kind of always know where you are. And it's a very, very easy operation and you won't get lost. And then in the end, you should kind of know the difference between a nerve and a, and a tendon. But truth be told, a tendon at that level can very much look like a nerve. So you think it can never happen to you, but uh, amazingly it has. So these are the take-home points. The biceps is a common pain generator, and you can see it in isolation, but I most commonly see it combined. I think tenodesis for most is really the answer. I have a hard time justifying tenotomy unless you have some, of the, some specific patient group. The suture tendon interface, I think, is the issue. And the problem is not all anchors will support large gauge uh, sutures and tapes. So that's why I use the anchor I use. Uh, Subpectral is the most predictable, and it clearly has been shown to have the lowest complication rate. You know, once, uh, once you go high, you can always go low, but once you go low, you're not going to go back, right? No one ever talks about taking the biceps and bringing it back up into the groove after you tina it. And uh, finally, um, I'd say subpectinodesis, it can be the same as suprapectoral, maybe, but uh, it's never going to be worse. So I'm not sure why you would do anything other than a subpectinodesis.